Praise God, the Lord is good. Amen. All the time He is good. And um, you know, the last few weeks we've had some good um, messages from Pastor Delson and Pastor Andrew as we looked and see how God wants to do something. He wants us to move in the spirit as opposed to the flesh. Amen. That, that we're not supposed to get drunk with wine, but we're supposed to be filled with the spirit. And, and there's some real practical outworking of that. Uh, that was taught, and I hope that some of you, when you miss church, um, that you're able to get the, the videotape. Um, we, we make many different ways of making that available to you. I was away, and I was able to hear these messages and get built up, and I, I want to just encourage you to stay abreast and uh, see what God is saying um, week to week. It doesn't matter who's speaking here. What we want to do is hear what God is saying to the person that's speaking here. And last week we looked and, and how Andrew focused a little bit on not just looking back, but pressing forward to what the things that God has for us. You know, sometimes we can get so focused on the back that we can kind of get stuck. Anybody ever been stuck? You know, and he looked at some of the dangers of getting stuck. You know, that sometimes the, the road's been meant to walk on, not to sit on. And, and so, you know, if you had one of those I keep forgetting what they call these things like my wife has now. It tells you get up and walk sometimes. Fit, fit, bit, fit, bit. Okay. Fit, bit. Yeah. Praise God. Um, anyway. So yesterday she needed to do more walking and so I got recruited to go with her. And that's not a bad thing, right? So God is good. I, I want to talk today, you know, when we look at the Great Commission, we see that there's a, this kind of a two, two-fold aspects of that. There's evangelism and there's edification. You know, ed evangelism is, is preaching the Word of God to bring somebody into the church. But when you're in the church, the great work that God has given to us is to edify. The church is to be a mature organism. Not just an organization, an organism, a living organism. And, and it's going through a process of edification to honor and to glorify God. And, and in the process, become a dynamic witness in the world. I think I've got some monitors on here that, that need to be cut out, okay? It says in the book of Acts in chapter 9, verse 31, that the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace being built up. Now, when you think of this word built up, it means edification. When we're edifying, we're building up. How many know that not everything that we do builds people up? Yeah, and we have to be careful that we're not tearing down. Of course, we could be passive not doing either, but I know this, that in building, if you're not doing either, then the building's being eaten up by rot or something. There always has to be a, a work of either repairing or building up, and God's given leaders in Ephesians 4 to the church to equip the Christians for service so that the body of Christ will be built up. That word again means edified. In 1 Thessalonians 5.11, it says, build up one another. And we look through at least, I think I have about seven different times that Paul just addresses the Corinthian church alone in this idea of edification. That, you know, not everything that you do is edifying. For instance, if, if they're all speaking in tongues but the body's not being edified, it's better to prophesy, speak the word of God so that everybody can get built up. In other words, if we don't understand what you're saying, what good is it? Right. It's like when I go to the Portuguese church and I listen, Pastor Del can get very animated, but if I don't understand Portuguese, it's hard to get built up. Yeah. I keep praying that God's given me by your spirit some understanding as he's doing this, right? But, you know, it's unless we understand the words. And sometimes, you know, we, we've got to really choose the words that we have so other people can, can be built up. So it's not surprising for all of the churches of the New Testament that the church that was most carnal and immature and in need of spiritual growth and development had Paul speaking to it so many times about this word edification. That is the Corinthian church. Now here's something we have to understand is edification should lead to maturity. 
edification should lead to completion in Christ. As Andrew was speaking last week, he was saying, we, we, don't, we forget what lies behind, we're pressing on. Why are we pressing on? Because Paul says, I haven't attained yet. And all of us should have this aspect about our lives that we know none of us have attained, and so therefore I'm pressing on. What am I pressing on to? Well, yes, I'm pressing on to the upward call of Jesus, Christ Jesus that, that he's already obtained from me, but the aspect of that is that he wants me to mature. He wants me to become more Christ-like. He, he wants me to represent him in a more mature way than I have in the past. How many believe that we should represent him in a more mature way in the future than we have in the past? So this edification, and that's what Paul writes in Colossians 1.28. He says, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So Paul's saying here, the great work that he has in the church is to bring people to a place of maturity. Amen? Amen? And in Ephesians 4, when we look at the 11 to 13, it says that Christ himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the mature or the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So here's the question that I have to ask. How do we identify a mature church? And by what criteria can we measure ourselves as a local body to see if we've arrived at a degree of completeness? Now, now if any church that is growing, any church that is maturing, is always going to have aspects of people that are different levels of maturity. That's part of growing up. That's part of raising a family. You, you don't have everybody in your family that's mature. You don't have everybody in your family that's an adult. But you would hope that the core aspect of that church is mature. You'd hope that if you have a mom and dad, that they're mature. Amen? You, you know, and, and so the same thing within the church. And so I want to look at some qualities today that would help us to be able to identify what's a mature church. What would be mature for you to be mature? As we look at that, Paul identifies three things in 1 Corinthians 3, 13, 13. But he says, now abide faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these things is love. Now we might be tempted to think maturity is something like power, prestige, uh, you know, whatever, uh, gifts. Yeah, some people think, well, I have this gift, and I have that gift. And the reality is that the Corinthian church had every gift. And yet they were considered the most carnal of all the churches that Paul addressed. Here, here's a, a key scripture that I want you to write down. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 2 and 3. Paul, in addressing the Thessalonians, said this, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope. Write down these three qualities, will you? Your work of faith, your labor of, of love, and your patience of of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Now, you would think that if Paul is saying this to the Thessalonians, that you would, all, if this is what he said as a criteria for a mature church, then you would see it littered throughout the rest of his writings. And indeed, that's what we find. Let me, let me just give you some examples. In 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 3 and 4, and if you have your Bibles, follow with me. You can do the underlining if you'd like. It's good, we're going to do a, um, they used to say walk through the yellow pages, but we can walk through the white pages here, uh, you know, the, the scriptures, and see what, what the apostles were saying. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 3 and 4, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Paul here addresses the Thessalonians in two of the three things I just mentioned. 
Uh, you say, well, the, why is the hope piece missing? Well, if you read the Thessalonian letter, you'll find out Paul has to address this area of hope because they needed to grow in this area of hope. In Colossians 1, verse 3 to 5, Paul writes to the church, We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Another address to the Ephesian church in chapter 1, verse 15 to 18. Paul wrote this to them. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. What, what were they needed to grow in? That you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance, in the saints. See, see, as we keep working through the scriptures, you see these are three qualities that is very important to Paul as he, he shares with the churches. When he wrote to Timothy, in 1 Timothy 1.5, he says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. And Peter wrote himself in 1 Peter 1, verse 20 to 22, that he indeed speaking of Christ, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. One, one more scripture. You don't mind me using the Bible this morning in church, do you? All right. Praise God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 to 24, it says this, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he, promised, he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love, and good works. It's clear in the New Testament this criteria is for developing the maturity level of the local body of believers. First, there's a love that's manifested toward other members of the body. Second, there's a strong and vital faith that we have. And third, there's a demonstration of our hope. And Paul concluded in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, that the greatest of these three is love. The apostle consistently drives this home, this truth, as he's corresponding with the different churches. And he's... Christ exhorted, even recorded in John 13, 34, when he says we are to love one another. Let, let me give you some more scriptures. We're going to spend some time reading scriptures. I understand that from Providence and New Bedford, we're the least biblical literate. So it's good to read scriptures. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's good for you to write down the address so you can go back and read this for yourself after. Look at Paul's addressing the churches in this area of love by itself. In Colossians 3, verse 12 to 14. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Okay, and when he's saying a bond of perfection, he's saying it, it's really clothes you in maturity. In 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 11 and 12, says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. Philippians 1, 
verse 9 to 10. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment that you may approve the things that are excellent and that you may be sincere without offense to the day of Christ Jesus. What's he saying here? He, he, you know, we're, we're focusing on one quality here for a moment, but he's saying that I'm praying that whatever love is being demonstrated in you will abound. It will increase. And we're going to see an increase in this quality. Seeing an increase in this quality says something about the level of maturity Amen. that we're doing. Amen? Ephesians 4, 14 to 16. I already spoke about how the apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists were part of the equipping of the saints. But it says here, why are we equipping the saints? Why are we equipping the saints to do the work of ministry in verse 14? That we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in what? In love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself, the building up of itself in, in love. The Apostle Peter also elevates love to a greatest level when he says in 1 Peter 4 8 above all keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins and if you concern yourself with another apostle the apostle John in 1 John verse 11 <laughs> I'm sorry, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 11, verse 23, chapter 4, verse 7, and again in verse 11, John is saying that we need to love one another. If, if I could echo something that Mr. Patello used to say over and over and over again, what we would hear is, is, we need to love one another. Can you hear him saying that right now this morning? You know, he, he would say that oftentimes. Sometimes you say, I don't understand why this has happened. Because we need to love one another. And, and the question then becomes, like anything else, what is love? How is it manifested? How can it be recognized in the body of Christ? And the most prominent passage that Andrew alluded to last week in 1 Corinthians 13. There, there's aspects of love in that chapter. And Paul spells out for the immature Corinthians. Re recognize now, he's writing this to an immature church. And he's describing exactly what I'm asking you. He's describing what love is and how love should be manifested in the body of Christ. Unfortunately, this great love chapter is often lifted out of context. It's put in itself by isolation. But to get the full impact of what Paul is saying, you need to see how he's describing love in light of the whole Corinthian epistle. And you must interpret his definitions in light of the Corinthian carnality. Then we have to observe the words that he uses in 1 Corinthians 13 in relationship to the whole body of Christ, not just to us as individuals. You want to note that Paul first writes about the Corinthians in chapter 1, verse 7, that they had been lacking no gift. This is an important thing to understand. They were not lacking any gift. You know, we, we, we can lift up gifts in our body and not have love. Many people could have many gifts, but we would have immaturity. It's interesting when you have love, gifts just seem to be natural, don't they? Because yeah. now we use the gift we have to be able to edify one another. If all we're doing is lifting up gifts, then we can get carnal, we can get immature, and we can just parade ourselves around very arrogantly. Paul spells out to this immature church how to manifest love in the body of Christ. And we need to observe these words ourselves, I believe, in relationship to the body of Christ, not just to us as individuals. Paul classified the Corinthian church in chapter 3, verse 1, as babes in Christ. 
And in verse 3, carnal and fleshly. So obviously the manifestation of spiritual gifts in a local church is not synonymous with spirituality and maturity. I appreciate the messages that Pastor Delson brought when he talked about being filled with the Spirit. Because many people are focused on some external manifestation and not the internal transformation. Paul writes this major assertion in chapter 13. No doubt there were more individuals in the Corinthian church who spoke in tongues maybe more than in any other New Testament church, yet at the same time they had a, a lack of love. And therefore he calls them, you're, you're like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. When, when I meet with different ladies and different people in different churches, you know, some of them, like, this, this demonstration is, like, top on their list. If you're not doing this, you know. And, and, and Paul, while he identifies that this is a reality of walking in the Spirit, it's not the most important. Not if you don't have love. The Corinthians had gifts of prophecy. They had gifts of wisdom and knowledge and faith. But they didn't have love. And so Paul says, then you're nothing. In verse 2. And some of the believers at Corinthian no doubt had gifts of giving. And, and they were even willing to give physically, sacrifice their lives in an act of martyrdom. And yet Paul says, without love, even this type of behavior is totally unprofitable. Well, in contrast to the operation of spiritual gifts, Paul describes, here's how to recognize love in the body of Christ. And he, he, he deals with some things that we'll see there's some negative aspects of what he's writing about the church that needed to change. The first thing is, love is patient in verse 4 of chapter 13. In other words, it's the opposite of what the Corinthians were demonstrating. They weren't demonstrating patience. They weren't demonstrating perseverance. They were impatient with one another. There was disagreements. There was divisions among them. Chapter 1, verse 10. Paul's saying here, love is patient. It's also kind and not jealous. And earlier in the letter, Paul had written about jealousy and strife among the Corinthians in chapter 3, verse 3. Love also doesn't brag and it's not arrogant. And Paul had to warn the, the Corinthians about false boasting in chapter 1, verse 29. He says, you know, he says, if any man among you thinks that he's wise in this age, let him become foolish that he may become wise. Let no one boast in men. What do you have that you didn't receive? But if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you'd never received it? You think, think about that for a minute. That whatever John the Baptist said the same thing. I have nothing unless it's been given to me from above. If it's been given to me from above, then it's not something I earned, I did, or... You understand? If God's given us grace to do something, it came from Him. How could we boast in what we're doing after that? It didn't originate from us. So we need to humble ourselves. Love doesn't act unbecomingly. Actually, this, when he speaks about unbecomingly, Paul here is talking about immorality. Immorality in the church. There's immorality in the church at Corinth. You know, and says, he says it um, in chapter 5 and chapter 6, immorality of such kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles. Can you imagine? He's saying there's as much immorality in the church as in the world. In fact, even more so. Mm -hmm. They, they were acting in the most unbecoming manner at the Lord's table. Even, even some were overeating, some were overdrinking to the point of drunkenness. <clears throat> Chapter 11. Love does not seek its own. It's not provoked. Doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. Here, here were believers in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, the first seven verses, and actually verse 8 as well, they were taking each other to court. They were defrauding each other. 
if, if you look at the contents of that, Paul's even saying, first of all, we shouldn't be airing our laundry out with the world. But brothers and sisters, we ought to be able to work through our problems ourselves. Now, now maybe you think that, you know, well, we're not going to some major courts. Well, gossip's the same thing, isn't it? I mean, wherever two or three are gathered, the Bible says, here is the Lord in our midst. He's watching how we're judging over situations in our lives. There's also the implication is that before I take somebody to court, I should also be willing to suffer some of the damages myself to forgive. I'm not saying there's courts for things. I'm just saying something here. If we only walk in our own self-justification, we're not loving. Sometimes we've got to be willing. Just like Jesus took upon himself sacrifice for what we did. And then he forgives us. So now we're to walk in love. How do we walk in the love that Jesus has? We've got to be willing sometimes to have strong enough shoulders you know what I'm saying to bear the burden so that you're not holding it as an account against somebody else let the Lord deal with that situation love suffers it, 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 it doesn't take into account a wrongdoing you know there, there was an insensitivity in chapter 8 of, of weaker members in the body of Christ you know and some that had liberty using their liberty to become a stumbling block to the weak in fact some of them actually participated in idolatry almost right in front of others it's like you know there's many things that we might have the the license to do but even though we have the license to do is it help building other people up and so therefore there are times when we should suspend our license because of the love we have for others it's going to be a stumbling block for them Love doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It's hard to conceive of such gifted Christians bragging about the immorality of the church. And Paul states this empathetically in chapter 5, verse 2. You've become arrogant about this immorality, and you haven't mourned about it. You know, if our brother or sister is in some kind of situation, the Bible says, those of you who are spiritual, go to them. Right? Help to lift them up out of the problem that they are. But, but if we're doing is this condemning and, and bringing that forth and, and almost sort of laughing it off, like we're better, if we can find enough fault in somebody else and bring them down, then we're bringing ourselves up. That's the way the world does things. He says here we're to edify one another, which means you're the one that take a step down and you lift somebody else up. After defining love and contrasting its ingredients with, with what the Corinthians were lacking, Paul gives some positive statements about love. It says it bears all things. That is, it suffers and bears up under pressure. Now, I've used in leadership training oftentimes about like a, a walking stick. You probably heard me use that as an example as well. If you're going for a hike, you know, a lot of people hike with like a walking stick or whatever. But if you're going to go on a hike and you want to pick a walking stick, you want to have one that's not cracked. You want to have one that's going to bear up your weight so that when you lean upon that stick, um, you're going to be able to transfer weight onto it and it's okay. And oftentimes I, I talk about leaders this way because leaders are people that you need to be able to put weight on that can bear some things so that when you transfer that weight they don't fall and you don't fall now if I was picking a stick I'd probably whack it against a tree a few times to make sure or hit it on the ground to make sure I don't have a hollow sound in it so there's a testing that needs to happen to see that that's going to bear up. So he's saying here that as Christians that are growing in maturity, we're able to bear some things that others that are immature cannot bear. How, how, are, you, how are you bearing up? 
How are you holding up to the pressure? Yeah, I wrote yesterday about how the Apostle Paul, you know, when, when they were sailing, they ended up shipwrecked in, in Malta. And the Lord had, had come to Paul, and, and he says, the ship's going to crash. You know, it's going to break apart. But I'm with you, Paul, and, and, and no life is going to be lost. Now, now, you know, it's like we, we could look at this other scripture, you know, Jesus sleeping in the boat, and all of a sudden you get a storm, and you wake up Jesus, and, you know, um, Jesus calms the storm. But that doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes the boat's been meant to crash. But you're going to survive the crash. But guess what? You might be treading the water for a little bit. You know, life, life goes through times of pressure. The thing that God wanted to tell Paul was, I'm with you. You'll make it through. And that's the thing is that if we're loving, we need to bear up under the pressure. There's going to be a pressure. That's part of life. That's part of what it means to be a Christian. That's part of what it means to, 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 to be able to cover the multitude of sins. It's what it means to be a body. When, 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 you're, when, when you're watching over your family, you'll take a hit before you let your family take a hit. At least those of us that are mature, right? He believes all things. The idea is this, that you're believing best. You're eager to believe the best. You're not looking, always looking to find the negative in something. So if, if that's all we did is focus on each other, we could find lots of it. Couldn't we? But the Bible says here, we need to believe all things. There needs to be an eager pursuit to believe the best in an individual. Love hopes all things. The idea here is we're looking forward. We're not just in some kind of pessimistic hopelessness. We're looking forward. We're hoping all things. Look, the condition that we're in today is not going to be the same as we're going to be in tomorrow. Right? You know, whatever's gone before us, let's forget that. Let's move forward. There's this idea that we're looking for something. Tomorrow's going to be a better day. That light always follows darkness. That morning always follows night. There's hope in God that one day He's coming back for us. Amen? And the work that He began in you and me, He's going to complete until the day of Christ Jesus. There's something to hope for. Love endures all things. There's a steadfast enablement that a Christian's going to continue even though they're in the midst of battle. Let's keep going. Let's persevere. Let, let's keep our eyes focused on the prize. Amen. The Corinthians, of course, were guilty on all these counts. They were not bearing up with one another. They were eager to believe falsehood about somebody. They were even f eager to believe falsehood about the Apostle Paul himself who had to defend himself in chapter 4 and chapter 9. They, they were negative in their attitude. They, they were succumbing to the pressures of the world. They were succumbing to the systems around them. And, and so we're approaching verse 8 and to 12 in 1 Corinthians 13. And, and sometimes people look at this and find this to be a little bit difficult to understand. But in context, certain truths become very obvious as we read this. Let me read the verses. Love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they'll fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. Known, and now abide faith, hope, and love. And these three, but the greatest of these is love. Paul's saying in context here, you know, there's some obvious truths. Gifts are temporal, but love goes on forever. We know in part. We prophesy in part. But
But when that which is perfect has come, that which is, in, what is partial will be done away with. Now many people, sometimes I think they, they misunderstand this scripture and they call that which is perfect that comes as Christ, only coming at the second coming and then you'll be able to see. But, but look at the context of everything that he's saying so far. That which is partial, he says, is a child. It's childish. It's looking at a mirror dimly. It's knowing something in part. If you're thinking like a child, if you're acting like a child, you don't have a bright perspective of things. But when that which is perfect, that which is complete, it's the man. It's being manly. It's seeing face to face. Now I shall see. I will be known as I also know. There's an idea that there's been growth. When you look at all of 1 Corinthians and compare it with the epistles that Paul wrote to the other churches, there's some conclusions that simply stand out. The believers in Corinth had not reached the degree of maturity and completeness or perfection that some of the other New Testament churches had reached. Remember, when we talk about perfection, we're just talking about maturity, not the idea that you never make a mistake. There's a certain level of maturity that an adult has over a child, right? That enables that adult to have responsibilities that a child wouldn't necessarily have. But here he's saying this church, this Corinthian church, they're babies. They're infants. They're childish. Yes, they're Christians, but they're childish in their behavior. They, they've made very little progress in becoming conformed to the image of Christ. They have not yet reached a place in their spiritual development where Paul could write to them like he did to the Thessalonians, like he did to the Colossians, like he did to the Ephesians or the Philippians, and where he would thank God for the faith, hope, and the love that they had. Rather, it seems that there's a void of these virtues in this particular local body of believers. In other words, they were living in a state of partiality. They were living in a state of childishness. They were living in a sense of dimness in their spiritual walk. And in order to correct it, what Paul is admonishing them, refocus on the priorities. First, he tells them, strive for a more excellent way. Pursue love. And then, earnestly desire the body, for the body, the greater gifts. Who cares if you speak in tongues? I, I, I mean, I hope you do. I hope you're able to, you know, pray before the Lord and all these things. What he's saying here, though, there's something greater than that. If you're able to prophesy over somebody, that, that's all well and good. But are you edifying the body? Are you loving other people? You have the, 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 the greatest voice and you don't sing like a canary. You know, if you have this wonderful voice, but, but then you come off from worship and then you bite and devour. There's something greater here to seek. The church... Is a vision for us to have is to become a mature organism through the process of edification, which is us helping to build each other up, and then this maturity is to be reflected first by the degree of love that exists in the body of Christ. Remember when Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3, he said, Be careful how you build. There's a foundation that we have to build with. And the church can be weak, it can be immature, and it can be constructed with wood, hay, and stubble. Or it can be strong and mature, composed of gold, silver, and precious stones. If it's immature, what's it going to reflect? Impatience, jealousy, strife, divisions, pride, arrogance, and even unbecoming immoral behavior. If it's mature, what's it going to reflect? A growing love. Christ-like relationships among the members of the body toward all men. An, an attitude that creates unity. An attitude that creates a one-mindedness. A mature body of Christ will also have a unity of faith. It has to do with the, the confidence that we have in the body of Christ and the head of that body, who is Jesus Christ. 
It's a unified conviction and assurance that God is. And He answers prayer. And He is our divine source of life. He is the source of our existence. It's also reflected in a steadfast hope. Manifested in stability. Manifested in steadfastness. Manifested in certainty. Particularly looking beyond the present to the day in which Jesus Christ will come again for the church. And in turn, he'll set up his kingdom. The question for us to ponder is where are we? What are we? What are we as a church? What are we as individuals? Are we growing in our love, in our faith, in our hope? Is this what's being demonstrated in us? In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, the writer says, Therefore leave the discussion of the elementary of principles of Christ. Let us go on to perfection. I hope to be able to share on these three topics in the next several weeks this idea of, of how we are to continue to persevere. How, how God wants the faith that we have to be demonstrated in our work. That our labor is an outworking of the love that we have for each other. And our perseverance can be seen because of the hope that's in our hearts. At, at this stage, I think it's important for us to say, when Paul viewed the Corinthian church, he was looking for certain qualities, as he was in all the other churches. Seeing how he addressed the different churches tells me that the different churches were in a different stage of development. For us as a church, it would be important for us to understand that we have a core body of believers that are demonstrating these qualities and others will be able to learn those qualities as they continue to grow with us. Amen? Amen? That's the goal that I would want to have. It's not the numbers. It's not the financial blessing. It's not any of these things. What are the things that the Lord's looking for in a mature church? Faith hope and a love that's demonstrated to one another. Let's take some serious thought about this. If there's any area that maybe I talked about today that maybe stirred your heart or pricked your conscience, just go before the Lord. That, that's what He does. That's, that, that's why He had lead us is to help us to edify, to build us up, to mature us in the things of God. Amen? Father, we just thank You today for your love for us. We thank you, Lord, that you call us and, and you're, you're building us so that we will be an example to the world around us of who you are. Help these qualities to be something that others will see in our lives. And Lord, let's not just look for what you have to do in somebody else right now. Let's just think about what you need to do in our personal lives. But if I, if I looked too much to the past and not enough to the future and trusted you, Lord, Lord have I been more concerned about what's in it for me than what's in it for someone else? But is my faith been sort of dead because it hasn't been demonstrated in the works that you call me to do? I don't want to be stuck on a road where you just simply die and decay and being trapped you've called us to walk really it's a good word of what it means to believe it's the parapeteo which simply means to, to walk with you walk a walk worthy of you Lord help us to walk help us to move in a direction that you desire from us the Lord we confess that in many ways perhaps our life has been immature but we stand before you today and say, Lord, help us mature, to grow up, put away childish things, take on adult responsibilities, bear some things, forgive some things, look out for the best. 
change us, transform us, so that we will be an image for church that is mature. You can demonstrate your love to those around us. We give you praise and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.